Okay, hi everybody. I'm David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. This is Don't Miss This. I think I just realized I start with okay all the time because you click it and I say okay to you and then everyone thinks I'm saying okay to them. So, well, maybe okay. Maybe that's your favorite word. Well, it might be. Um, Y'all, welcome to the last week of the Summer of Heroes. We're Here a we little are. sad. Yeah. And happy. But a little sad. It was so fun. Yeah, it was super rad. And uh, if you're just joining us, Welcome to the last week of the Summer of Heroes. <laughs> Summer's not ending. I don't know when summer ends. In September, I think. Oh, yeah. 21st. I think September 21st. Is that right? Yeah. So still enjoy your late August nights, everybody. Just still sit enjoy. Out. Unless you live where it's winter and then just stay by the fire. Stay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Our winter of warrior people down in the southern Henny. Yeah. Um, and school's about to start. When you watch this, now, which makes me so tired. But. And while we're thinking about our people, I just heard last night about this cute little group of women at the Ivy, a little retirement place that watches every week all together. Don't you just want to say hi to them? I am going to say hi to you, oh, Ivy that's ladies. So cute. The Ivy League. <laughs> My sister. So cute. Uh, that's so awesome. Yeah, so all, um, all of you, we're just so glad you're here. We're so happy to be with you. And to be done with the Book of Alma. We love the Book of Alma. But it's kind of nice to check that one off the list. You, the you feel book. like you made it through. Yeah. And if you read one time only the whole summer, no worries. Now here comes fall. <laughs> you can start <laughs> reading scripture again because yes. that's what happens that's to me, I so feel like. True. We will recap all our heroes sometime in here as we get there because you can't help doing it on the oh, very last day. They're such good ones. Plus, what about all the ones we didn't do? Right. Um, we gave some mention to some. Oh, yeah. Anyways, we wish we could have done more. This section of scripture, Alma 53 to 63, is so huge. Listen, they should have renamed the Book of Alma. Let's do this if we're ever in charge of... The Book of Heroes? Yes. I want to rename all the books of scripture. Did okay, you know that Alma, project I What have? if it just has underneath it a little subtitle? It says Alma, and then it says the Book of Heroes. Everybody wants to read it now. Who is in charge of the PR for the Bible? I mean the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> the I, Bi- <laughs> I think it's... <laughs> He's not in charge of the PR. <laughs> Listen, who named the book of numbers? That person should be fired. Okay. Um, at least Alma gives you a sense of like, I like that guy. Um, <laughs> 53 to 63, 14 years of thick war history. Wait, we is haven't even talked here. about, you jumped way too far ahead. Can we please talk about, we're going to do 10 chapters that are going to be so good. I just said that. No, we didn't talk about the war or the soundtrack or any of that. <laughs> Because this is the second time recording it because Emily's computer has a sickness. It has corona. Um, (laughs) Remember, I hate it when you talk about corona. Um, Um, Yes. Say what you want to say about this part. Here's your suggestion. Before we even get into Alma 5363, remember last week we talked about all the how to get fortified and setting up your defense and all of that. Then this week we really go into battle everyone and it's serious battle they're not messing around so we have a couple ideas for you they're fun (laughs) first of all i have to say this that before we push record emily said i get so nervous when i read this chapter as she's flipping through even though it's the nine thousandth time that she's read it but (laughs) because it's scary everyone (laughs) and i get so nervous about what's about to happen (laughs) also they use words that are really like pull you into the story so my heart starts beating a little faster yours does too my heart does yes yeah it does i i get intense about it um so, so jinx <laughs> yo me a dr pepper um okay your suggestion was pop popcorn oh. you want to pop popcorn everyone you, this is like a movie we're entering into the major motion picture part of the book of Mormon. we got no summer blockbusters this year so this is it. Yeah. Play like Braveheart soundtrack or The Last of the Mohicans yes, in the like background that. The whole time while you read. Something like that while you're reading. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want to do. And um, we're Get gonna... someone good at reading too. Yes. And then. Yeah, that's exactly what you have to do. Put Every on your night, movie voice. Popcorn, soundtracks, cozy clothes. This is going to be... <laughs> You have to get all cozy if you're going to watch a movie. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, that doesn't match the war. But oh, yeah. <laughs> or wear your battle outfits, whatever you want. And what about this idea? Who wants to get little army men and set them out? Talk about that. Okay. I had this thought right before we push record. I was like, because it gets super confusing. Yesterday, I tried to go through it really slow again to just be like, okay, who's who and where are they? 
And you can get these maps. You could just Google one or we'll link one in the newsletter. We'll find a good one where someone's like said, like based off of the Book of Mormon's actual words, this is where the land northward is. This is where desolation is. This is the EC, whatever. But even without that, you can just move, like get a risk game and move army people so that you can just visualize and see. Then they went over here. And then and you're going to be even more here. nervous at that one part and the one chapter that I'm so worried about when all the stripling warriors are being chased. And you will have to watch it while someone's <laughs> reading move. it. Yeah. Lego people. You See how excited Lego you people. are for this week? You can't wait for what's about to happen. <laughs> we are ending the Summer of Heroes with a bang. Yes, we are. Um, all right. Okay, show, let's show them the board. Here's the board. Okay. There's the board, everyone. We'll walk you through the board. Yeah. Okay. The battle that we want to focus on the most um, and the group of people we want to focus on is our last heroes for the... For the Summer of Heroes, and they kind of became our mascot, I guess, for it. Um, they're, <laughs> they're a lot of people's mascots. They're so from happy the in heaven right now. Yeah. They just got they're, made a mascot. We're the mascot, right? I know, they are so happy. Mostly because, um, I don't remember what I was going to say, but so just they're a mascot. <laughs> um, MMLX, this is our big number. It represents these 2060 Stripling Warriors that we're going to talk about. We'll talk about the 60 in just a second. But if you go to Alma 53... Yeah, um, that's where we have to start. Where were we last time? We just had... Remember, Amalekiah is kind of the leader of the Lamanite armies, and Moroni is the leader of the Nephite um, armies, and they have just been clashing with each other. Moroni keeps saying, this is in defense of our people, of our, our nation. What you start ha seeing happen, though, is you start watching kind of a civil war happen within the Nephites. And this will get mentioned a couple times in the chapters that had we not been fighting among ourselves, we wouldn't have been so vulnerable to the Lamanite army. So almost Which like scares this. scares you. You just realize the power of division and contention and what it can do to a situation. Right, right. And that's why this war kind of flames up again is, is because of that. Um, but at this time, you have a new leader. Um, his name, he's Amalekiah's brother. His name is Amoron. I call him Amoron. I, it makes me just so happy when it just says, and then Amoron took over <laughs> the Lamanite army. It's like, Listen. I can't help but read it every oh time like every that. Every junior high boy is so happy right now. And all their moms are like, Amoron. It's Amoron. No, if it's a bad guy, you can call him Amoron. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, so you have a time period when things get really, really intense. In fact, where's the verse that says in 53 that it's the most dangerous Oh, but wait, before you go there, can we first do this and then it's in verse 9. Um, I love this. What's going to happen is we're going to have the 2060 who you love, but there are a million other heroes in these 10 chapters. And you might want to keep a list of those. And like Lehi is one that we meet, but Pahoran and Tiancum oh. and... There's all these people. Let's say the Lehi verse because yeah, I verse actually two. love that verse. Yeah, yeah, that's where I want to go. So it's um, chapter 53, verse 2, and it says, um, And Moroni went to the city of Mulek with Lehi and took command of the city and gave it to Lehi. And then you love this part. Now behold, this Lehi was a man who had been with, with Moroni in the more part of all his battles. And he was a man like unto Moroni. And they rejoiced in each other's safety. Yea, they were beloved of each other and also beloved by all the people of Nephi. And remember when we read about um, Moroni and who he was, that the very powers of hell would be shaken if all men ever were and could be like Moroni. And then you love that this Lehi was a man... Um, like unto Moroni, and we forgot to mention last week. Oh, Remember, let's you do want it. To go back yep. so bad. Go make this um, cross reference. It's Alma forty eight eighteen, I think, or maybe nineteen. Um, go there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Seventeen's that one that where Moroni's a hell shaker and <laughs> wants to wear my t shirt and bracelet. In eighteen, it says this: Behold, he was a man like unto Ammon, which you love. He hears Ammon. Yeah, the uh, son of here. Mosiah. And even the other sons of Mosiah, and Alma and his sons, for they were all men of God. Now behold, Helaman and his brethren, and this is the line we love so much, were no less serviceable unto the people <laughs> than was Moroni. You love that Moroni gets to be a hell shaker, and Helaman is no less serviceable. <laughs> well, it's cool because I like, I like that it says this right after Helaman. For they did preach uh, the word of God and baptize. And it's like, I thought it was cool that... 
everybody kind of has their own place. Mm. And none of them are no less serviceable than the yeah. other. There's different ways to shake hell is what I'm trying yeah. to say to you. It's so good. Right? Yeah. We, we just love that they, Moroni sets the standard and everybody else is at that same level. Like they're all this group of people who are like, um, should we be good? Yeah. Let's, let's do it. Let's be this good. And it makes, I don't know, maybe this thought would have been cooler at the end of this, but I might forget. So I'll say it right now that I think it's neat sometimes to think about that we kind of got placed on earth at the same time. Mm. In, in, my, uh, in my mission, there's a Korean word for the group you came out with into the field. Your MTC group, it was called your dongi. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you just kind of like, oh, that's my dongi. Like we did MTC together. And it makes me kind of think that in heaven, these people are like, oh, Moroni and Lehi are like, remember that? You know, man, yes. like they were their earth dongi. You know, yes. like we did earth together. That's we battled so awesome. together. Like, and there will be a kinship with the people that you battled together with um, on earth. I think for the rest of forever, there will just be that connection that's, yeah, that's there. And so it's good. really neat. Um, so then we get to the part that you were talking about in verse 9. Um, but before, let's just talk about this. Remember when we talked about they built up all the places and the timbers and all that? You're going to see that happening in 3 and 4 and 5. They're making these preparations. They're setting up guards. And then it tells us in verse 9, because of iniquity amongst themselves. So it's exactly what you were talking about. There was iniquity amongst themselves because of dissensions and intrigue among themselves. Which is so interesting because it's their own what's not right among them it tells us places them in the most dangerous circumstances that a little bit makes you feel nervous when you read it yeah um that they're going to go into the most dangerous circumstances that they've been in so and, far and i think we'll see it's a major theme of next time's lesson um when we enter into the book of helaman like you really are going to see how how dangerous it is a, a prophecy of the full downfall all because of that very issue yeah um particularly in a book that we are told again and again and again right. is written for our time you're like oh helaman is gonna like it's a little spooky actually yeah when you read it yeah as we get into helaman we're gonna want to be watching for what do we see um in our own spaces and this is a really great place to start like wh what do we see of this in our own um, communities and in our own countries and and where are we filling this um, fight because you get that you get a warning for what you know it's not necessarily a prophecy but more it can be act as a warning like look what can happen because of it um, so we go back to the anti Nephi Lehi's remember the anti Nephi Lehi's and um, this clear back we looked up how long ago it was and it was between 13 and 26 years before now is when they made that covenant that they were going to bury their swords so that whole group of lamanites all of those people now um have not fought for that however many years that is at least probably 15. um somewhere between 15 and 20 is what i like to imagine in my head and um they see this this big dangerous situation that they're entering into and they decide we probably need to help like we're we're not helping so we should probably go and dig up all of our weapons yeah the phrase in 13 that's so rad with that is that they were moved with compassion to defend um these people um they had been there if you look back two verses because of the pity and exceeding love of ammon and his brethren that they left they left the palace to come and rescue them and how can we not now take part in rescuing the rest? And, and so you just see, it's awesome because uh, that when we get these sons that are about to come, I know you know the story, so that's not a spoiler. When you get these sons that are about to come, um, <laughs> they are a result of compassion, love. Um, integrity, integrity, obedience. Right. They're, they're just an outgrowth of these people who've been surrounding yeah. them their, their whole life. And it's so interesting because as they start talking about this, it's Helaman, remember Helaman, who jumps into the story. And you kind of want to keep in your mind as we talk about Helaman, what was his battle-ready um, challenge? And it was to take care of sacred things, right? That's who Helaman is. He's. We're going to watch him be that throughout this. And that covenant in Helaman's mind was a sacred thing. And, and he feels that um, so clearly that he doesn't think they should 
break that covenant. It tells us in here, he, he feared that they would lose their souls. And so they were overpowered by the persuasions of Helaman. That's verse 14. And his brethren that they shouldn't dig up their arms, but they were also um, compelled because they're watching their brethren go through these afflictions and the dangerous circumstances. And so as they talk about what they should do, they realize they have a group of sons who never made the covenant, um, who who hadn't buried their weapons. And I think it's interesting too, to think about at this time, although they were sons who hadn't made the covenant, they were also sons who had been raised up, not with the knowledge of war. Um, they hadn't been taught in weaponry. They hadn't been taught to use swords. They didn't have those things in their homes or in their families. So it's so interesting to me that the parents are like, here, let's use them, this group of boys who haven't been trained for the situation they're about to be placed in, which is really interesting because instead of relying on their own strength or their own knowledge or their own what they're good at, they have to enter in relying on God, that there's nothing else um, that they can rely on. Yeah, and you see this line about them. I love in verse 16 when it says, it came to pass they had many sons who had entered that covenant. Therefore, this is the middle of the verse, they did assemble themselves together at this time. I think it's super rad that it was their idea, that they see a situation and they're like, wait, there's actually something we can do about this. And it's it wasn't like the young men's president's like idea. Yeah. It was like they assembled together and said, we could do something about this. And you love the thought of that, um, of the youth being empowered to say, I I'm going to rise up to the challenge that we're facing and, and actually do something. And um, as they rise up um, and enter into that, knowing what their weakness is, but still it's, it's all of them together that make them strong and, and they written. enter into their own covenant yeah which I think I, is yeah so in 17 and you, you almost want to ask the question where do you think they learned that from right they they immediately are like okay we'll enter into our own covenant now i think right um let's do this one verse and then we'll look at this list yeah maybe right here um but let's say i want to say this unless i forget it I probably will, won't forget it when we look at the list, but already you, I think it's so awesome to start thinking, am I the kind of person who uses all my persuasions to help people keep their covenants with God? Mm, that's so good. Am I the kind of person who sees a need and then assembles my strength or other people together? Um, or who do I have in my life that is an assembler or who is a, a persuader? Mm -hmm. or For is, good. Yeah, and it's just neat to think mm -hmm. about um, all of these people fought the war together, and that's why they're going to win, is they have the influence of all their different spiritual gifts and, and their capacities. In 19, I think it's so neat that it uses mm -hmm. this line. Now behold, as they'd never hitherto been a disadvantage to the Nephites. So I like that it's like, up to this point, they weren't hindering anybody, but they kind of were just there, you know? And sometimes people can be just there. It's like, you're not a disadvantage, but you're not necessarily helping either. It says, and now they became at this period of time, a great support. And if you look ahead, fast forward to the end of this story, these um, 2060 will actually be the turning point of the war. They hadn't been a disadvantage up until now, but now their entrance in it is going to make all, all the, the difference. difference. And um, it's interesting because right now there are only 2,000. So you want to watch because there's a great lesson that we'll enter into. There are 2,000 right now. You love it. Tells us in verse 9. And they would that Helaman should be their leader. 19, you mean. Yeah. Oh, yes. In verse 19. They would that Helaman should be their leader. And um, I love this because Helaman at the time... Um, what he would have been known for was um, leading the people spiritually. That was his job. Remember, that's when he talked to, when his dad talked to him, he handed him down the plates, and he, in essence, became the spiritual leader over all of these people. And I love that the boys are like, they don't choose the best warrior, and they're not the best warriors. And I'm not saying Helaman wasn't, because maybe he was amazing at war, but we know what he was amazing at was teaching the Word of God. And that spiritual leadership. And I love that those boys are like, we're going to pick, this is what makes us feel comfortable is having a leader who believes 
um, the same way we believe, and we're going to let him lead us. And as I was thinking about that, as we were reading this, I thought it makes me think a little bit of President Nelson. And remember when he um, gave that challenge to the youth? And as we were talking about when you said, um, it's so interesting because it was all those, that age of boys that got together and said, okay, let's do this. This is our idea. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make a covenant and um, we're going to enter into this situation. And you think about where we are in the world today. And I just think to myself, I look at the kids who are between the age of 12 and then all the way up to the young single adult ages, you know, of 26 and 27. And I think to myself, that is where our strength lies. Those are the people we need to say, we, we've never been a disadvantage necessarily, but right now what we are gonna become is the greatest help for our generation and for this time. Yeah, and they bring, uh, each people, each people, all people bring like a different perspective and a different look at things. But I like, on that note, over in Alma 56, um, 44, Helaman says this, and I think this is cool. Like for those who aren't in that age group, he says, therefore, what say ye, my sons? Will you go against them to battle? And I think it's neat that he them and trust them to say, okay, you make what, the decision. What do you want to do? 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 What should we do? Oh, I love that where they're just like, I love that he looks at him and says, I'm um, you, you entered into this. This was your idea. I'm going to let you lead. And what comes out of that. Um, I love the call President Nelson gave to the youth of the church. And I'm just going to read you a couple lines, but I just think they're so empowering. He says, would you like to be a big part of the greatest challenge, the greatest cause, and the greatest work on the earth today? Would you like to gather Israel during these precious latter days? Would you, who are the elect, be willing to help find the elect who have not heard the message of the restored gospel? Then he says, my dear extraordinary youth, you were sent to earth at this precise time, this most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. There is nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. This is the mission for which you were sent to earth. Um, I love when he talks about um, uh, telling the youth to join the finest team for this, the final phase. Um, he says, those noble spirits, those finest players, those heroes are you. I testify that the gathering is now and that it is real. And I love that, that you could each add your name to this list of um, summer heroes. And then this is what he said at the very end. My beloved young brothers and sisters, you are among the best the Lord has ever sent to this world. Isn't that amazing? Um, and then he says this, I invite you to stand with the youth from all around the world and experience the thrill of being a member of the Lord's Youth Battalion. And I just, you just can't help but see hints of this generation that was going to rise up and let this prophet lead them through what would be the most perilous time in the days that led up to Jesus Christ coming to the American continent. It's just, I love that enthusiasm and that engagement and that mm -hmm. willingness to, to enter in. Um, I'll never forget, um, you know how kids pass notes at school? Not as much lately as they did when my kids <laughs> no, were in junior like, high no. because they text, but in the olden <laughs> days, people pass notes. In the ancient times. And one of my kids, I remember, had this big pile of notes in their room and I was cleaning their room. And you never know what you should or shouldn't throw away. Do you know that as a dad? I don't know. But as a mom, you have to be like really careful. You don't want to intrude on someone's space, but you also want to help keep things clean. And <laughs> so I was down there and I opened up this one note and it was just a short note. And the person had said to one of my kids, let's be good, but not too good. That's what the note said. And I was like, what's wrong with being too good? Yeah. Like, why don't you want to have the type of friends that are like, let's be good like let's do this yeah. you know what would happen if everyone that was in your group of friends was like let's let's be good let's just decide this year that's who we're gonna be yeah and they're year. and they're gonna be good in their own way they're gonna battle differently than the adults battle and or whatever like good doesn't mean nerdy you don't have yeah. to be like valiant and courageous in like this yeah you know 
Yeah. But some people want to be it in a nerdy way, which yeah, is fine which too. Can. Yeah. But just be engaged in doing good and, and what could happen. Um, when my parents served as mission presidents, um, they chose a scripture that was going to represent their three years that they were there with all of um, the young men and young women who would serve with them during that time. And the verse that they chose was Alma 5320. And to this day, it is one of my favorite verses in the whole Book of Mormon. Um, it's a verse we talked about over and over again for those three years. And, um, and the missionaries would recite it. And it says this, And they were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage and also for strength and activity but behold this was not all they were men who were true at all times in whatsoever thing they were entrusted and i love thinking about those words about courage and valiant and strength and activity and being true and um they were words we studied i was um in high school when my parents got called as a mission and i was the oldest so there were six of us those were words we studied over and over again for three years and they were words i wanted to be i wanted that to be if someone was going to describe me then maybe they would say that i had um, courage and strength and activity and i fell in love with that word valiant which is actually the opposite of apathetic isn't that interesting mm. the opposite of apathy is valor or valiance it's it's just being all in to what you decide to be and um as a teenager sometimes that takes a a conscious choice right yeah because a default is apathy yeah. right that's just like our natural tendencies being carnal sensual and devilish is yeah. is to go that direction so we have in the study guide um, and you'll see on the board just a list of some of the adjectives that describe this group of people and we were just thinking as we wrote this list it's so awesome that like all these kind of describe all of the people that we've been looking at yeah. um all summer long and and it would be neat to do one or two or a couple things with this one might be to just talk about what do these things look like um in in our lives or in our stories or who do you know that yeah, i love that this you idea. know like yeah if you were going to write someone's name of who keeps their covenants um, who would be willing to fight for you in all cases? Who do you assemble with? Who's your greatest support? Who do you know that's exceedingly valiant? Who do you know that has great courage? Wouldn't it be fun to just list who are your heroes in that arena? Yeah, and if I were a mom or a dad, wait, which I am, <laughs> <laughs> it could be cool to kind of um, like write the opposite kind of note that one of your kids got in high school. And to just, you know, point out to friends or to your kids or to neighbors or someone like what you see in them. One of these things that you see that just like, I just, one thing that describes you is that you're true at all times. Or anyways, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with this list of adjectives of, of these people. Um, it continues, um, Alma 53, 17 through 21 is where we found a lot of these and also Alma 57, verse 27. You can add that um, onto it also. Um, Before they... we, well, I'm trying to think. Let's just take a pause right here because we're going to be right here before we go down to this next little part. Okay. Because we're talking so much about the youth and this generation that rose up and, and just becomes exactly what is needed in that moment. And we love that there is mentioned within here the fathers and the mothers of mm -hmm. all those boys. And I think it's important to look at what was it that the fathers were doing and what was it that the mothers were doing and what do we know about that group of people that would help us as parents to raise that kind of children. And there's just a couple hints through scripture. One thing you can do is go back to when Ammon was actually teaching the people. Remember, these are the people who never will fall away. That's who these people are. And so it's neat to go through and look at these anti-Nephi-Lehi parents and to go back into Alma 23 and those chapters right there and look at and see how, what, what adjectives would you use to describe their parents? Um, and what were they doing that they became so converted to their covenants that they would never fall away from them? But two that we see in these chapters, um, we see the dads in Alma 56, 27. We talk about the moms all the time. We don't talk as much about the dads. And in um, Alma 56, 27, it tells us um, in the 
second month of this year, there was brought unto us many provisions. Um, they're talking about to the army. And guess who brings the provisions? Um, it's the dads. It's the dads who come. And can you imagine how hard that would be as a dad to walk into the front lines of battle and to see your boys there and to realize all you can do in that moment is offer like substance, right? Food um, and sustenance in that moment. But I think sometimes that is true about where we are because we do see our youth on the front lines. If you've ever walked into a high school, uh, you've, you've been in the trenches, you've seen the front lines and often all we can do, we, we can't enter into that situation with our kids. Can you imagine? How mad your kids would be. I think I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I teach seminary, I might be. Just you have so to you stay know. at the seminary building. You can't go into the world. And all of a sudden, he's there. What, what's your second period? Okay, I'll see you at your locker. Um, that I think it's neat that the dads realize this is not our fight. This is not our battle. This is not our place. But we can provide support. That and, will strengthen you. And these are dads who have seen war before and they know exactly what they're about to enter into. And it's neat that they don't just like send them on their merry way, but they are just, they're right there with them. I remember um, even as a, um, as a missionary, um, as a young dad, and, and even now, like just my dad's been here before. Mm. And I loved as a missionary getting letters from my dad um, because I just felt like, oh, he's been in this place before and he knows it. And as a... Um, as a young dad, I can remember one night in particular, just kind of the burden of being a young dad, like financially and um, school and just all the things and just calling my dad the next day and what a support, you know, that was for me. It's yeah. just, it's awesome to, to see that. And, and then in particular with my dad and these dads, it's just, they got so lucky that they had dads who were covenant keepers mm -hmm. and that the only thing that would have caused them to break their covenant was compassion it's just yes. neat that it was like that's so the neat. only thing that would have caused them to break a covenant was compassion it wasn't selfishness it wasn't lust it was that was the only thing that tempted them to break yep. that oath and it's just that's awesome and then you know the verses that everybody loves so much about their moms yeah in 56 47 it says that they didn't fear death um and, and, they, and they thought, they did think more on the liberty of their fathers than they did upon their own lives. Hmm. Um, that's such an interesting covenant word. Because if I were to say what's the opposite of a covenant relationship, it would be a consumer relationship. Which are okay to have in your life. Like if Smith's isn't doing it for me, then I'm going to go to, you know, Macy's or, some, or yeah, somewhere else, right? But a consumer relationship says, if you're not meeting my needs, then I'm out. But a covenant relationship says... Um, this relationship is more important than my needs. And that, you see that in the boys. Mm -hmm. They're just like, I thought more about the liberty of this people than I did about my own lives. And then it says, you know where we got that from? Uh, from our moms. Which by nature, moms are like that. They can't help it. Where they have to put the needs of others in front of themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have to, but they choose to. And if we don't doubt, um, God will deliver us. That is the lesson that they learned um, from And you love that one line, we do not doubt, our mothers knew it. And yeah. just the thought of, you know, what did their mothers know that instilled that kind of belief in those boys? And I love the thought of that. Um, and, the, and just the power of that. Yep. Even, I was just thinking that last week, my mom doesn't even know this. She listens to this on her runs. Go mom, speed <laughs> up. Um, but last week I was I was struggling a little bit, like with some, you know, you just get into like a little faith slump sometimes and doubt can creep in. And my mom just so naturally just expressed like her just belief in God being bigger than all the problems. And it was such a strength to, and she, it was just spontaneous. I mm -hmm. didn't tell her what was going on. And it's neat that there is that kind of power that can yeah. come you know, from that. Yep. And I love you see their moms again one more time in 57. We don't hear this verse as often, but in 57, um, 21, it says, yay. And this is describing the boys again. They did obey and observe to perform every word of command with exactness. Yay. And even according to their faith, it was done unto them. And then Helaman says, I did remember the words which they had said unto me that their mothers had taught them. 
And I love the thought of that, that their moms had taught them to obey and to observe to perform every word of command with exactness. That's hard, um, you know, especially when you're raising, for some reason, teenage boys. My mom used to always say to my brothers, um, when she'd tell them, go up to your room, get this and this, come back down, and then they'd come back down with nothing. But, and they'd just stand in front of her and she'd be like, what are you doing? And, and they're like, well, I went upstairs, but when I, when I got up there, I couldn't remember. And she would always say, put your hands on your shoulders. And they would. And then she'd say, feel upward. Is anything there? She would say <laughs> to them all the time when my brothers were teenagers. That's what she would say. And so it's actually pretty awesome that these boys had learned to perform every word of command with exactness because... It's not necessarily a trait of that age of boys, um, but it's neat that they had learned that from their mothers. Yeah, that's awesome. I just, it, I, someone said this one time, and I just have always loved it, that they said covenant-keeping fathers and righteous mothers equal stripling warriors. Like mm. that is the math equation that we're seeing in this. They are an outgrowth of that. We have on this paper why they're going to win, and we've kind of gotten into this a little bit, some of these verses here um, that kind of show like, wait, they actually, you know this, that they win these two major battles that they have. Um, they win the first one, and then we'll talk about what happens in between the two of them. Um, but these verses are so neat with why they win, but where's that one that I just saw that was so awesome that I love my most favorite in, in all of this? Um I wrote it down here. Oh, yeah. Okay. 5616. I think this is so rad, this verse. Mm. Um, when the people who are in that city. So now when you get into chapter 56, this is Helaman writing a letter to Moroni telling him, this is how the war is going on our front over on the other front. And he says, the people of the city that we came into, they were depressed in body as well as in spirit. For they had fought valiantly by day and toiled by night to maintain their cities, and thus they had suffered great afflictions of every kind. And now they were determined to conquer in this place or die, um, just at the end of their ropes. Therefore you may well suppose that this little force which I brought with me, yea, those sons of mine, gave them great hopes and much joy. And I, I think that is so beautiful, yeah. that just their arrival. They make up, I did the math yesterday, they make up only 20% of the entire army that's there. But when they came in, it just was like, now all of a sudden it like lit a fire in everybody else. It was like, okay, we believe again. We have hope again. Yeah. We like, this is something we can do. Yeah, it's so good. And you love that this time it's 2,000 that come and, and give that reviving. But then we're going to watch what happens again. But I think it's fun to just fly through these things. So oh, yeah. Let's look at this list. In 56.5 is the one where we talked about they chose Helaman to be their leader. And we love that. That's one of the things um, why they will win is because they chose a spiritual leader um, to, to run that whole situation. And I love the thought of that. Um, the second one is the support of their dads, that they just have people in their lives who are... Um, bringing support. They know how to surround themselves with the, those kind of people. So they're going to win because of that. The third one... It's their moms. It's their moms. And their obedience and, and learning to be valiant and have courage and all those things that they learned from their mom. And then the last one, 57, 25, we actually haven't gotten to yet. Uh, but it's but the best one, one out of all of them. Yeah. And 57, 25 says this. Um, this is after the oh, second battle. Yeah, so let's talk about... What, let, should we... Do what happens extra in between 60, them. Yeah, and 57 Yeah, six. before we do that, let's say one other thing that I thought of just just barely, and it's this, that they fight this battle and nobody dies in it. Um, when they're, they they're wounded. When they fight the second one, it says every single one of them is wounded in the battle. And I think that is so important to know, first of all, that everybody gets wounded in this battle. That's not a sign that God isn't there. And this verse, when I read it yesterday, 56, uh, 26, was a little bit troubling to me. And um, it's that's a lie. It's not that one. It might be 57, 26. <laughs> um, I just want to, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It says, their preservation was astonishing to our whole army. Yeah, they should be spared while there was a thousand of our brethren who were slain. And we do justly ascribe it to the miraculous power of God because of their exceeding faith in which they've been taught to believe that there was a just God and whoever didn't doubt, they would be preserved by his marvelous power. And then I was like, 
I feel really bad for that thousand people who died in that verse because you're like, the reason they lived is because they they believed and, you know, yeah. and, and, and it was kind of like, it made you think like, well, if something goes wrong, does that mean that I did something wrong or um, that God didn't care about the situation? And then if you just continue on to the end of the chapter, I think it solves it. Yeah. It says, again, we are delivered out of the hands of our enemies and blessed is the, blessed is the name of our God. For behold, it is he that delivered us. Yea, he has done this great thing for us. Remember those great things we're keeping track of this mm -hmm. year? It says, Now it came to pass when I, Helaman, had heard the words of Gid, I was filled with exceeding joy because of the goodness of God in preserving us, that, might not, that we might not all perish. Yea, and I trust that the souls of them who have been slain have entered into the rest of their God. And I just think it is cool that it, that verse kind of shows both sides. Yeah, they like, were all good. Right. They were you all saw good men. God in this place through this kind of deliverance, but then you also saw a different kind of deliverance with those who died. Yeah. And I, I just think that. So keep going to the end if you get troubled by that verse. Okay, let's talk about in between the two battles. This is our best part. Yeah, we love it. 57 verse 6. This has been our theme for the whole entire summer because what happens is they're fighting. And, it and tells people are us, still asking. They're like, wait, you have 2060. <laughs> and they're like, why isn't it 2020? That's and why so isn't it 2000? And it's like, okay, here's the answer, friends. Here's the answer, to that. everybody. This is why it's 2060. Because in Alma 57, 6, it tells us they receive a supply of provisions, remember? And it's coming from their dad. So it's coming from their hometown. That's where it comes from. And this time with that um, supply of provisions, they receive an addition to our army, um, to the number of 6,000 men besides 60 of the sons of the Ammonites who had come to join their brethren, my little band of 2,000. So now they're 2,060. And it's at that point that Helaman writes, and now we were strong. Who loves that we all thought they were strong this whole time? <laughs> Elon's like, it was actually those extra 60 people, which is not very many people compared to like 2,000. Or the 6,000 that, that came, came like in that same verse, yeah. right? And it's so funny that he mentions, oh yeah, and the 60 yep. who joined our little group. And do you like thinking sometimes about like, what, where were they in the first battle? Like, were they afraid? Yeah. Were they yeah, lazy? Were they not old were enough? They, were uh, they... Did they not want to come? Did they like? Yeah. Where were they? You know. But it's awesome that once they come, he says, and now we were strong. Yep. Right. This idea, and then for the rest of the time, you'll notice he always says, "My 2060." He changes it, and he's like, "It's my 2000. My 2060." And you love that every single one counts. Like every one matters. Um, and no matter how those last 60 got there, the importance of Or why of the they fact, didn't come in the first yeah, place. Just the importance of the fact that they were there. Right. That's all that mattered. And we love asking this question of who is missing. Who is missing that would make us strong? And we don't care what the reasons are, you know, that mm -hmm. they are missing. But that's such a great question to ask. Like, where are those 60 who haven't joined in this fight? They will come out of this battle believing in a God yep. of, that is bigger than beforehand. And how sad if those 60 didn't get to be a part of that and experience that. Yep, and I love the thought of um, when, we, when we talk about asking um, who's missing, really asking who's missing. Because sometimes we're like, oh yeah, that's true. And we should like look at the list and who's not here. And, but how many times do you really like sit down with a group of people and say, who's missing? that would make us stronger. I had the most interesting experience. I was teaching the New Testament many, many years ago to a group of kids. And um, we were teaching the wedding feast and when they send out the servant and um, to go bring more and go bring more. And um, I asked my kids just, uh, it was kind of a figurative question because we're having a figurative lesson and I kind of was thinking they would just think about it in their head. Um, who would you invite? That's what I said to this. And it was early morning seminary and usually the kids were pretty sedate. Um, who would you invite? And immediately this one kid goes, Dakota. And then this other kid's like, yeah, we should invite Dakota. And it, pretty soon everyone's talking about Dakota and I'm so confused because the lesson has like derailed now because 
who's Dakota? <laughs> and also, in my mind, I'm like, do they realize we're not really having a wedding supper? Like, they, I, I was like, just a nice something to think about. Well, then they like, they get into it in that moment. They're like, yeah, Dakota, let's, that's a great idea. Let's invite Dakota. And one kid's like, I live two doors down from him. I can pick him, my mom and I can pick him up in the morning and this. And he didn't have scriptures. Who was going to bring the scriptures and whatever. Like they make this whole, I just stand there and watch and they make this whole plan. And then everybody gets up and leaves. That's the end of the lesson. And this girl walks up to me after and says, I hope you're fine if we invited Dakota because um, he's like, he's not very good at being in a classroom situation. Like he gets kicked out all the time of a classroom situation. So I hope you're okay if we invited him. And I was like, oh, sure. Anyone can come to seminary. And so sure enough, the next seminary morning, early morning, in walks this new kid I've never met before. And he actually had hair kind of like my hair is, short here, but really a long bang right here. It didn't have hairspray in it. It just hung right here. So you couldn't really see his eyes. He just walked in and he sat down and we did, all of seminary and he just sat through all of it and didn't really say anything and then left and I was like oh well that worked out perfect and then Dakota came to the wedding supper and it was so fun well then he came again the next time and the next time and the next time and I got him a folder and everything that he needed and he came consistently every single day to seminary until one day he didn't come anymore and for a couple days he didn't come and finally I was like everybody what happened to Dakota? Where is he? And um, turns out he really had been struggling with stuff over at the school. And he had um, been asked to leave that school. And so he was gone. And then that was the end. And at the very end of seminary, you know what happens. We clean out our all of our where our kids keep their stuff. And I always look through to see if anyone's left something that they're going to care that they left. And I found a whole folder in the bottom. And as I looked, I saw, oh, it's Dakota's folder. And I opened it up and I was just so interested. Um, you'll notice that in all the important stuff, all his paperwork, everything, empty. Empty. Not one thing. He didn't write anything anywhere. Um, I think he filled in one page of his journal, but it's so interesting to me because on the other side of the paper, I'm gonna show this to you. On the other side of the paper, there's just this little note right at the very top can you read it and it says dear sister freeman thanks for teaching me the gospel and that's it and um he just left it there and i don't know if he knew it was his last day on his last day that he knew he wasn't coming back um but oh it is so neat to me that this kid who just when we asked who's missing who everyone was like we don't know if he's gonna really like seminary took a second on that day, which probably wasn't a good day, to write a little note in a folder that he didn't even know if a teacher would ever say, to say, thank you for teaching me the gospel. And it just really makes you think to yourself, who is missing? Yeah. Um, who needs to, even if it's just for a couple months, who needs um, that and the strength that they can bring to yeah. that situation. Because if you could find him again, you'd almost want to say to him like, oh, Dakota, those other kids taught you the gospel. Yeah. When they brought you. Yeah. And we were not strong until you came. Yeah. Right? That's what's so, not that you did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, yeah, you, you know, do but like, what is it? You know, what is yeah. it? It's, com it's compassion, right? Yeah. The only thing that was, so that very last, why they won, 57-25, um, is a line that says, um, everybody got wounded and all that stuff, but there's a line right in the middle that says, um, according to the goodness of God and to our great astonishment. So shocked about how good God mm -hmm. can be. And in that story, the goodness of God was displayed, you know, with people going out to find who was missing. So it's just a beautiful story. And like how neat to look at all of these people um, that we've seen throughout this entire summer. Remember at the beginning when we said this is kind of like a movie yeah. and you want to play the soundtrack? Well, at the end of this, you want to play that song 
You know when they play that song? <laughs> yeah, and they put up the picture and they're like, the and, piano. Now, and now this guy's He's like, here. Jimmy ended up getting the girl. <laughs> and this and they guy moved to Georgia. was a coach for 40 years and won whatever. <laughs> it actually does that in at the end of Alma. Who's happy about that? At the end of the movie, then you go to Alma 62. And um, then you get there and it says in verse 43, Put up a picture of Moroni right now. And Moroni yielded up the command of his armies into the hands of his son, whose name was Moroni Ha. And he retired to his own house that he might spend the remainder of his days in peace. And Pahoran did return to his judgment seat. And Helaman did take upon him again to preach unto the people the word of God. And you just love that. And then everyone just goes back to their regular life. And that big um, battle story, that epic battle that takes place, um, is is done for a time. It's going to come back up when we get into Helaman, but you just love that little... That it just kind of gets, yeah. you know, wrapped up. One thing that we hope that you would think about, when you look at all of these words that describe the Stripling Warriors, and when you look at all of these things that we talk about um, with our... our Summer of Heroes. Oh, P.S., by the way, our 2060, this is their verse, the one that's on your poster, and then they were strong, and the battle-ready question is, who is missing? To ask yourselves that question, and and man, what, remember, everyone's going to go about that differently, which is so mm-hmm. cool, but when you look at all of these people, um, what you realize is they all bear the marks of the Son of God. Every single one of them reminds you of him. You can't help but think of Jesus when you read through this mm-hmm. list. And some of you might not have fathers like the Stripling Warriors did or mothers like them. Some of you might not feel like you have a leader like Helaman. But everybody has the Son of God to yeah. look to and reach to. And even though we've said like this is a book of heroes, our big emphasis in the Book of Mormon this year is this is a story really about one hero. They said the reason that we won was not because of this or this or this. It really was because of the goodness of God. He's the reason any of us are going to win this battle Mm -hmm. or any battles that we're fighting. And so it's just so cool to um, be in this donkey of people, (laughs) you know, who are looking to him as our leader. Yep. Yep. So good. All right, y'all. See you in the Book Book of of Helaman next week. Jinx again. It's two Dr. Peppers. (laughs)